All right, excellent. Thank you to everybody who is tuning in for another EBFA webinar. Super excited for this topic. Um, obviously, it is perfect timing with everything that is going on in the world. Um, but I do want to take it a little bit beyond just the current state of um, COVID and where everyone's minds are. Maybe you're COVID did out and you're ready for some content that is not focused uh, around COVID in the conversation. But I do want to tie it in um, somewhat because I do feel that there is going to be uh, some uh, sequelae of effects that we are um, going to need to pay attention to. And that's really relating to this topic of leaky brain. And that's, that's partly why I wanted to do it as well, to get everybody on the same page and a little bit uh, on the forefront of what potentially may be uh, influencing those that were diagnosed with or had gone through COVID. So first time with the EBFA, thank you for tuning in. If you're returning to one of our webinars, then special thank you to supporting EBFA. My name is Dr. Emily Spickle. I am the founder of EBFA. I'm also a functional podiatrist in New York City, human movement specialist. I'm going through my fellowship in functional medicine from the, anti, uh, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And I treat primarily patients with chronic movement dysfunction, chronic neurological conditions, chronic pain. So this is also a topic that's really important to me for my patients, um, as well as to myself and then the industry and everyone, um, as I had mentioned. So now, um, real quick, why I wanted to do a webinar on leaky brain is that you may have uh, heard from social media and just different podcasts that I've done that I had COVID. I first presented with symptoms now almost five weeks ago, maybe it's even almost six weeks ago, and presented with that. Some of my initial uh, symptoms were more GI. So uh, obviously that's going to tie into what we're speaking about um, tonight. But initial symptoms, GI, diarrhea. So going along the leaky gut, leaky brain, you knew that I was starting to destroy my gut biome because of this diarrhea. And then the next symptom that I had in COVID was that my arms and my hands weren't really working. So they felt very clumsy. This is important to also understand and relate to leaky brain when we get deeper into this topic is that's oftentimes some of the presenting symptoms that these patients or individuals will complain about. Um, obviously, I started having concentration issues, um, and then it led to the classic uh, chest pain, shortness of breath. And then second week of COVID is when my brain fog hit me. And the brain fog that I experienced with COVID was not your normal, oh, I'm having a hard time concentrating. It was like dangerous level brain fog. Um, I was in Connecticut, isolating from my family. And if I had to pick up a prescription or anything, yes, I had a mask. Um, but I would like literally not see, not see cars. I wouldn't understand, you know, where my dog was after two weeks of quarantine. And I came home to my family, I had to drive and I wouldn't see the red lights. Like I would literally drive through red lights. This is very dangerous of the degree of brain fog that I was experiencing. So I'm past COVID, past the other symptoms, and I'm getting this residual um, brain fog that is extremely scary um, to be going through that for anyone who has experienced brain fog. And that's where I started to delve into this a little bit deeper. I'll talk about towards the end what I did that really made a huge difference. And now five weeks from my first, almost six weeks from day one of my symptoms, I am, knock on wood, feeling better than I did before uh, March 1st, before I was even thinking about COVID uh, and kind of the reality of what where we are now. So let's get into why this topic is important. Leaky brain. 
your brain is obviously literally everything. When you're thinking about brain optimization with yourself, with your clients, with your patients, this is where we're thinking of it from a cognitive perspective, from an emotional perspective, and then a, a movement perspective. So you want to have you know, optimal cognitive function as you get older or throughout your life. You want to have optimal memory. You want to have, you know, fast processing. You want to be able to um, uh, kind of quickly process things, not multitask, but be able to quickly process things. You want to be able to dual task. So that would sit on the cognitive side. Now, if we go towards the emotional side, this is extremely important. There's a lot of research that as you start to get different neurodegenerative disorders, depression rates go up, anxiety rates go up, actually personality changes start to happen with these individuals. So that would be the emotional side. We start to lose emotional flexibility when we start to get decreased brain optimization. And then finally, with the movement side, you start to get clumsy. Your hands and your feet don't work as well. The coordination of movement and then when it becomes a greater um, or further progression of the brain effects, that's where you start to see gait changes, classic gait changes that we see in Parkinson's and MS or status post-stroke. So leaky brain is important. It's important to every single one of our ourselves for our patients, for our clients. Even if you say, I'm a movement specialist, why is this important to me? It is important to you for the exact reasons that I just said. Now, what does a leaky brain look like? What does the sequelae of a leaky brain look like? When you're thinking of individuals, you're, you should start thinking about those with chronic neurological conditions. MS is one of the uh, chronic neurological conditions that's most studies that relates around leaky brain. We will be referencing this again. If you're looking at in, in the world, there's 2.3 million people living with multiple sclerosis. Now, if you want to tie it in, in even further to movement, one fourth of those individuals with MS actually have neuropathy. So we have uh, leaky brain, uh, degeneration of neural processing, cognitive, emotional, motor imbalances. And now we start to bring in these peripheral disruptions of their movement patterns. Alzheimer's is another one that's often associated with leaky brain. 44 million people in the world have Alzheimer's. This is massive. United States and the National uh, Institute of Health, NIH and NIA, are spending billions of dollars researching and trying to find a cure or reducing and preventing Alzheimer's. That's one of their largest missions, uh, probably not through 2020, but going into 2021. Um, and then if you think of the numbers, this is recorded numbers of people who have had COVID, just to make it a little bit kind of timing of where we are today, 3 million people in the world is, is what they're saying um, the last time that they looked have COVID. Now, that's not accurate because the number of people that are in New York City that have it is grossly, grossly underreported. So I would probably actually say that the number of people in the world that were exposed to COVID or uh, actually presented symptoms and went through the inflammatory process of COVID, even though they didn't have a formal diagnostic test because testing was not available, probably 15 million is my guess. Um, so anytime I see them put, put a number of diagnosis, I always multiply it times five. So now let's talk about what's happening with leaky brain. So leaky brain, it's not the only barrier that we have in our body. We obviously have the gut barrier, right? So we have the important um, intestinal endothelial barrier. We also have the um, retinal barriers. We have the placental barriers. That one is obviously extremely important to protect the fetus and the development of the fetus. And then another one that I want to focus on really appropriate with COVID as well is the blood, lung, or this airway barrier, because there was obviously this is a respiratory presentation. But when we get further into what is happening, when we look at uh, the vast array of symptoms that present with COVID is you want to think of all of the endothelial barriers in the body and COVID is really creating an endothelial dysfunction. 
This is why if you've seen in the news that they are reporting people who otherwise you would not suspect having a stroke get a stroke. And that's because there's this endothelial barrier breakdown that is seen with COVID. But mind you, it is seen with inflammation. So the underlying tone of what you're going to see throughout this entire webinar is that inflammation, inflammation is driving a lot of this. Obviously, COVID in this case is driving it, but other viral infections can, gluten, poor diet, right? Mold, Lyme disease, fungal infections. There's so many things that can cause inflammation in the body. Inflammation causes a breakdown of these endothelial barriers. Now we know we have the blood brain barrier. We have our gastric intestinal. You also have your lung, very, very important. Since we're focusing on leaky brain, what is happening? We're starting to get what's called the blood brain barrier dysfunction. What does that mean? So if you were going to research this a little bit more and educate yourself on it, you would want to research and look up blood brain barrier dysfunction. Now, what that means is that we are increasing the permeability of the blood brain barrier. We will go into exactly what that is. Okay, so you're starting to get a breakdown of what is called a tight junction. So that's what's essentially keeping things that we don't want in out. Now that permeability you get a breakdown of this tight junction, and this allows immune cells to get into, in this case, the brain, into the central nervous system. You get inflammatory cytokines into the brain and into the central nervous system. And then very important here is you get viral and bacterial particles into the brain and the central nervous system. Now, some of the big viruses that are known to penetrate the blood-brain barrier and get into the CNS is going to be Epstein-Barr. So if you've ever had mono, this is one that will house and get into the central nervous system, and then it'll lay dormant there. It's one of the viruses that is often associated or is researched as potentially associated with MS. Another virus that does get into the blood-brain barrier and into the central nervous system is HIV. So there's a lot of research around HIV-related dementia and HIV-related personality changes and motor changes, and it's because the virus gets into the central nervous system. Um, and then other ones are West Nile virus, Zika, as well as a myriad of other ones. Now, when you get leaky brain, so leaky brain, whether it's associated to COVID, maybe it's associated to an autoimmune condition, maybe you have lupus or fibromyalgia, maybe um, you have celiac disease or you have a gluten allergy or you just eat crap, whatever it is. You drink a lot of alcohol. There's different things that cause this. Now, the symptoms of leaky brain are brain fog. Now, you might be saying, what is brain fog? How do I know if I've ever had brain fog? So brain fog is a decrease in focus, decrease in memory, decreased in clarity, uh, decreased in logic, and decreased in problem solving. Uh, some people will say that they feel kind of out of body in a sense. It's a little bit scary for some people. Um, I would say the way that you can also describe brain fog is um, if you've ever taken, you know, like cold medicine and you get that disconnected feeling, that's what some people will associate it to. And uh, for my women out there, my mamas, uh, if you've ever had a baby and you get mommy brain, that's brain fog. <laughs> that's obviously much more hormonal related, but that is brain fog as well. Now, another big one that we see here associated with leaky brain is chronic fatigue. So there's a lot of research around chronic fatigue syndrome and leaky brain, inflammation in the body, that this is something that we need to address from a blood brain barrier perspective and inflammation perspective. And guess what? A gut perspective for people who have chronic fatigue. Now, what's interesting is that when you look at ways to prevent leaky brain, sleep is one of the most important ways that you can optimize or decrease um, the blood-brain barrier 
permeability. So when you start to get a breakdown in the blood brain barrier, sleep is super, super important. Um, so you kind of get in this little catch 22 with those that have chronic fatigue is um, quality of sleep is not good, but they need the sleep to protect that blood brain barrier. Another thing that you could see is motor delays and clumsiness, anxiety and depression is really prevalent as well. And then personality changes, like I had uh, stated earlier as well. So now you might be asking yourself, what is causing this breakdown of the blood brain barrier? Why are we losing integrity of that endothelial lining? These are some of the most common reasons, and I'm going to go over a few of these. Of course, I don't have hours and hours to go into this. So please note that everything or anything that I say, you can totally delve down into that rabbit hole even deeper and get tons more information. This is to pique your curiosity, get you in the right direction. And if you've been curious of this topic for a while or um, suspicious of it or just intuitively knowing there was more to this, then hopefully this helps you uh, get into that right direction. So these are going to be the big ones. So we get first one, depletion and ATP. If you don't know what that is, that relates to your mitochondria. If you don't know what your mitochondria is, I'm going to get into that in a second. But that is essentially the energy factory of your body. If your mitochondria are not functionally functioning optimally, you will not be functioning optimally. As you age, your mitochondria start to decrease in their optimization of function. If you didn't have mitochondria, you would not be alive. So you need to optimize your mitochondria. Second most common one that's going to be, again, spoken about, spoken about, spoken about is inflammation. You can refer to inflammation as acidic. So when your body is a little bit more acidic versus alkaline, then that causes a breakdown in the blood-brain barrier. Um, typically, people who have rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune conditions, their body sits a little bit more acidic. That is the inflammation aspect. You can get what's called reactive oxygen species. These are oxidative stress markers. And then reactive nitrogen species. So both of those, um, ROS, RNS, those are uh, different types of free radicals or um, levels of oxidative stress, infections, huge one, and then leaky gut. Obviously, that gets into our um, topic or our title. Now, there are some researchers that just refer to this as just it's a leaky endothelial dysfunction knowing that it's more than just the gut. It's more than just the brain. We have lots of these um, endothelial barriers throughout the body. Now, here we go. Going into the first one is your mitochondria. So your mitochondria, again, this is the powerhouse of your cells. This is where you produce energy. That is where your ATP is formed via your electron transport chain. Not going crazy into it. But I want you to appreciate that your mitochondria, again, are the life force of your body. If you want to be young longer and you want a, you know, one of the best biohacking aging kind of approaches is get after your mitochondria. Towards the end, I'm going to go into supplements that can optimize your mitochondria. Those are going to be the ones that you want to take. Now, mitochondria, they are a form of bacteria. They have their own DNA. It's actually the oldest um, uh, part of our bodies, of our cells. It's kind of a bacteria that came into cells and then became um, a symbiotic relationship with our cells. So a lot of people will reference that when you think of like intuition or your um, craving certain things like you're craving steak or something like that, but that's actually your bacteria talking to you. Your bacteria are very, very intuitive. Um, that might seem a little way out in left field, but just let it percolate for a little bit that your, your mitochondria and your gut biome and all the bacteria, they've just been around so much longer. And we do have this symbiotic relationship with them and they do, um, essentially run everything, um, do explore it a little bit more. So now when we're looking at mitochondrial dysfunction, 
if you also think of chronic disease, chronic aging, um, you know, diabetes, autoimmune, all of these are related to mitochondrial dysfunction. So it is one of the root causes of aging and chronic disease. Now, when we age, instead of being this very efficient factory for energy, instead of being an efficient factory for energy, what happens is that your mitochondria starts to create free radicals. So it creates one of these ROS. If the whole point of our system and preventing aging is to reduce inflammation, reduce oxidative stress, we want to make sure that we are not upregulating uh, the oxidative stress through the actual formation of our energy. So it's very important to make sure your mitochondria are efficient. Now, your mitochondrial dysfunction can arise because you don't have a lot of mitochondria, or it could be that you're not getting the substrates for the mitochondria, or it could be that we get this breakdown in the electron transport chain. Whew, here we go. I'm not going into this too, too in depth, don't worry. <laughs> but what you will see here, I want you to pay attention here that this whole electron transport chain to get your ADP into ATP here, this, what you need is NAD. So when we talk about supplements to optimize your mitochondria, that bad boy is going to be one of them. This is how it's going to work. Okay, so let's talk about inflammation. Inflammation is a second reason, probably one of the most common reasons that we get a breakdown in the blood-brain barrier. So we must control the level of inflammation in our body. This is acute inflammation. This is chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation to a degree is protective. Obviously, that is your innate immune response. But then when we get into chronic inflammation and low-grade inflammation, that drives endothelial, endothelial permeability, and then everything starts to kind of crumble from there. So when we're talking about inflammation, this is where you may hear the term cytokines. If we go back to COVID, I am sure you've heard in the news or you've read or you've um, uh, been in a conversation related to cytokine storms. And that's what's happening when people go from I'm sick to you know, I'm, I'm on a vent, like they, they quickly have a turnaround in the way that their symptoms are presenting. And that cytokine storm is essentially from this extremely rapid uptick in the inflammation, where the immune system almost starts attacking itself, because it's not being um, uh, regulated. And now it's just kind of, uh, having a very difficult time indicating or determining which cells are healthy versus which ones are infected. So let's go into this. A cytokine is a signaling molecule. It is produced most commonly by the micro macrophages. And the most common cytokines that you will hear about, particularly now, are going to be interleukin, IL-1. Oftentimes, you will see interleukin 1b or beta and then interleukin-6, and then TNF-alpha. When I do um, different cytokine tests and I gauge uh, cytokine levels in my patients, those are these are the ones that I'm typically looking for. There's a few other ones, but I'm going to focus on these ones. Now, the purpose of the cytokines that are pro-inflammatory is that they are kick-starting the innate inflammatory response. Because remember, if you get a mosquito bite or... Um, you know, you cut yourself, you want to have the innate immune response kick in. Obviously, there's inflammation, the area turns red, you get the white blood cells that go through this little pus, right? And then they do their job and then boop, your, your uh, cut heals. It's when the immune response goes awry or is overactivated, I think in the case of autoimmune diseases, right? So what happens in autoimmune? Your immune system starts to attack itself. The driver of that, because what is uh, regulating the immune system in the body is inflammation. So autoimmune conditions are associated with chronic elevation of inflammation. Please remember that. So now interleukin-6 is a very interesting cytokine. It is 
a pro-inflammatory cytokine, but get what, guess what, guess what? It is an anti-inflammatory myokine. What the hell, right? So when it's communicating more in the blood and in other cells, it's actually going to be pro-inflammatory. But when we exercise and we contract our muscles, it's actually anti-inflammatory. When it is in the muscle, this anti-inflammatory characteristic is actually different than the pro-inflammatory cytokine. They communicate a little bit different. So it's not exactly apples to apples in a sense. A lot more research on this that you can do, but just understand that interleukin-6 does have positive. All of these cytokines have positive. So you don't want to say, oh, well, I need to decrease my interleukin-6 because it might cause a cytokine storm. And that's where people are having issues with COVID or um, it's causing blood-brain barrier permeability. And that's where they're getting sick and things like that. So it is a positive or it has a positive role as well. Now, what's interesting here is that interleukin-6 is also produced by adipocytes, fat cells. So people who are obese have a higher baseline inflammatory level in their body. Systemically, they have a higher systemic inflammation. That puts them more at risk at cytokine storms with COVID for that reason. Yes? So now, uh, what's important with interleukin-6 from the rest of its purpose is that it creates this differentiation of our CD4 cells and it converts the innate immune response to an acquired immune response. This is where we start thinking of antibodies and you know future exposure to bacteria and viruses that we've seen before. Um, the way that you measure interleukin-6 is by a CRP. So if you've ever heard of those blood tests, anytime a patient comes in, I'm doing a an ESR, typically a CRP. So there's different inflammatory blood tests that you can do. Now, high levels of interleukin-6 are associated with autoimmunity. I alluded to that already. Lupus, sclerosis, RA, MS, uh, fibromyalgia, different things like that. So now, inflammation and the blood-brain barrier. What is happening here? Inflammation, that is the number one cause for a decrease in integrity in the blood-brain barrier. Now, there's two ways that your blood-brain barrier can get, uh, can lose its integrity. Two ways. First way is what's referred to as disruptive. So this is where you can think of, um, you create a space in the tight junctions and you can actually get uh, cells that you don't want into the central nervous system, enter it. Whereas the non-disruptive uh, loss of integrity of the blood-brain barrier, that's a little bit different. That's more these molecular reactions that are happening across the blood-brain barrier. And it's important to remember that your blood-brain barrier is an, is an endothelial lining. And because it's a blood-brain, what that lining actually is, is it's the blood vessels. So the blood vessels that supply the brain, the endothelial lining of the blood vessels is the barrier. If that is still confusing, then you can think of it like the skin, right? The skin of the blood vessel is the barrier. So when you start to lose integrity to the skin or the endothelial lining is really what it is, right? Then you can either get ions, so you, you start to change the positive negative balance on either side of this lining, or you actually get kind of little spaces and then a virus can get through. Yeah. Okay. I hope that that's clear. Now the non-disruptive changes, those are often associated with the systemic inflammation and it creates what's called a neuro invasion of pathogens, which you never, ever, ever, ever want to happen because these guys, they, they lay out there and they just stay there. Right. So we do not want to have that happening. Now from a neuro inflammation perspective, that is the other one. You want to keep your blood-brain barrier intact to prevent neuroinvasion and neuroinflammation because that's leading to MS, Alzheimer's, uh, increased risk of stroke, uh, anxiety, depression, personality changes, motor disorders, clumsiness, etc. Okay. Now, our third and final cause of a leaky brain. Right. First one was mitochondrial dysfunction. Second. One was inflammation. 
third one is going to be related to our gut. Now these all interrelate, but let's take a little look at leaky gut or the gut brain axis and the importance of our gut and our gut biome. So now your your gut biome, super, super important and a fascinating area. As I mentioned before, these are some of the oldest parts of your body, that bacteria that's been years and years and years and years before we were ever walking around on this planet is where this bacteria had first started. Now, what's interesting is there's 100 times more genes than in our genome that exists in our gut fascinating is that your GI system, meaning your intestines, your colon is 100 times the surface area of your skin. So the hairy skin outside your body that communicates with the external world. Guess what? Your internal skin GI is 100 times that surface area. That's a lot of skin that's interacting or endothelial, endothelial lining that is interacting with our environment of our um, ecosystem inside our body. Now, the weight of your gut bacteria is equal to or greater than the human brain. How cool is that? And then we were once thought to be born sterile, and then it's not until we uh, vaginally are born are we introduced to bacteria. That has now been squashed. They know that fetuses are introduced to bacteria and actually have gut biome that is forming uh, in utero. That's actually where your blood-brain barrier starts to develop. That's where we start to develop a lot of um, our uh, gut-brain axis is actually in utero. Uh, we get bacteria from our mother through their oral, so the dental, so a mother's dental hygiene is extremely important because that's actually being passed to the fetus. Um, they've shown um, different bacteria in the amniotic fluid. Um, so it's quite, quite interesting, obviously, how uh, we are being introduced or starting our gut biome. And then neurotransmitters are found in the gut at levels equal to the brain, serotonin, specifically serotonin. You have more serotonin receptors in your gut than in your brain. Serotonin, again, this is where a lot of people with depression and anxiety take the SSRIs, which are serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So that's where gut brain connections, very important for people with depression and anxiety because your bacteria is making a lot of it. So now gut, uh, gut brain axis, speaking of this already, so this is the communication between obviously your gut and your brain is through the autonomic nervous system, that's your vagus nerve, is through your immune system, we've already been alluding to that, and through hormones. So really important to understand this gut brain axis and how they influence each other. Gut brain axis influences mood um, and uh, memory and motor, but it also affects the potential permeability of the blood brain barrier. So your microbiota or your gut biome and the blood brain barrier. So this is um, a very important relationship. Obviously that's the whole focus here within this uh, webinar, but your microbiome actually plays a very important role in developing the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. This is what I was speaking about earlier, that serotonin plays a really important role in the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. So that uh, the uh, amount of serotonin is very important. You will see that serotonin and optimizing serotonin is through very specific probiotics. Now, when good guts go bad, so the integrity of your intestinal blood barrier is compromised. Uh, when it's compromised, it then allows that, that dysbiosis can then essentially get into your blood system and start to affect all other organs. Is it bacteria that's going out of the gut that we don't want out of the gut and now it's in your blood system and now it can go to different organs? Or is it inflammatory cytokines? Yes, that is the focus of this webinar. Inflammatory cytokines that are 
um, getting out of the gut and then getting into the bloodstream. And then now, oh, oh, now it's going towards the blood brain barrier and starting to create a, a permeability of the blood brain barrier. So this is disruption of your gut and the microbiota is related to sugar, poor diet, taking antibiotics, getting an infection, doing a cleanse, having diarrhea, and super important, stress. So if you want to go into COVID as well, and everybody is, whether you admit it or not, is stressed out to some degree because of COVID. I mean, we are in a pandemic here. So not knowing economically what is happening, not knowing if you are going to get sick, if your loved ones are going to get sick, what's going to happen to the world, just humanity, all of the shit that is happening, that's very stressful. So just the stress in itself is starting to disrupt so many millions of people's microbiota, which is creating dysbiosis, which is creating inflammation, and then that starts to create blood-brain barrier permeability. So what are we dealing with here? We are dealing with stress response, chronic stress. This is causing a decrease in the tight junctions, which creates a permeability of the gut barrier. Toxins in, nutrients out, increased inflammation, blood brain barrier permeability, leaky brain, here we go. So what happens as a sequelae to blood brain barrier dysfunction or leaky brain? There are many things that I've already alluded to, but here MS, let's just take a moment for MS, okay? So MS and the blood brain barrier. So there's a lot of research around the role of leaky brain and potential viral pathogens getting into the central nervous system, or is it inflammatory markers that are getting into the central nervous system with MS? Both of those are heavily researched as an association or a cause for MS. It's quite interesting that you see higher MS rates in uh, colder climates. So the Northeast has higher rates of MS because there's higher viral um, kind of thing, cold and flu season, right? It's colder. Um, you always see trends higher of MS in uh, climates such as that. And it makes sense because there's different viruses that exist in different uh, climates. That's already been a discussion with COVID. Okay, so MS is one of those. So now what do we do? I'm sure that is really why you are tuning in here and you want to know what do I do? What do I do to protect my blood brain barrier? Or if you had COVID like I did, what do you do to increase the integrity and get that inflammation out of your brain? How do you build your gut biome so that you can keep great gut uh, integrity so that that helps your blood brain barrier integrity? So here we go. We're going to break this into four areas. Oh my gosh, what was Emily doing? Clearly I still have <laughs> brain fog. One, two, three, four, five. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Blame the brain fog. Let's get started. Getting into target one, building the biome. So part one, we are going to build our biome. Now, when it comes to getting your gut biome back in track, if you had diarrhea or stress or inflammation, or you've had sugar, you've been drinking, things like that, you want to make sure that you're really, really focusing on your gut biome. Now, there are different pro probiotics on the market. All of them are different quality. Um, some you have to be refrigerated. Some have different um, strains. Now, these are the two that I look for when I advise patients to take different probiotics, bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. And then these are some of the specific ones here. Now, uh, lactobacillus ruminus is one specifically that has research around it towards protecting the blood brain barrier. You can see all of the, if you look at the back of the probiotic, you want to be very specific to which ones you're taking. Um, some people are a fan of taking single strain probiotics and then others like multi-strain. So just make sure you're really looking and researching and educating yourself on the different probiotics that are part of your probiotic. Um, and then also just so you know that some probiotics have um, different preservatives in them that cause a histamine reaction. Histamine is obviously going to create inflammation. So if you've, if you've ever had a reaction to certain probiotics and you actually get maybe uh, more diarrhea, 
you may have a uh, histamine sensitivity to that specific probiotic and I would switch. Um, this is one that I recommend in my office. It's called Doctor's Biome. So it is one that does have to be refrigerated. It has 14 different um, bacteria or strains of bacteria in it. Um, and uh, if you email me, I will send you a code to get a discount on that. Uh, but this is one that I do like for my patients. Now, target number two, systemic and brain inflammation, reducing our systemic and brain inflammation. So these are going to be the anti-inflammatory supplements that I recommend to my patients. I started by putting a asterisk by all of the anti-inflammatory supplements that cross the blood-brain barrier, but then those are the only ones that I take <laughs> and that I recommend to my patients. Um, as, I had as I had mentioned that most of my patients have a lot of neurological presentations, so this is what I'm, I'm used to recommending anyway. Um, these are great. Curcumin is great for penetrating the blood-brain barrier. Krill oil, if you're looking at your omegas, I like to take krill oil as the form of the omega that I recommend to patients because it has higher blood-brain barrier uh, permeability. And then R-lipoic acid, please make sure that you are taking R-lipoic, not just alpha-lipoic. Acetyl-L-carnitine is a big one that I use in my neuropathy patients. That one actually increases nerve growth factor. Quercetin, incredible one as well. Magnesium, every single person should be on magnesium. Um, there's some great research showing that just, you know, I don't want to say worldwide or globally, but we are um, by nature on a very low level of magnesium. A lot of people have insufficient levels of magnesium. And then resveratrol. Uh, you do want to be careful with taking resveratrol in MS. I was reading some research around some of the reactions that you can um, see in those patients. So these would be the ones that I suggest for, for decreasing systemic and brain neuroinflammation. Target three, let's muscle up our mitochondria. These are going to be the big ones that we go after for our mitochondria. NAC, that is a huge one. Glutathione, huge as well. NAD, remember I had referenced that with the electron transport chain. Coenzyme Q10, PQQ. Oftentimes you can get CoQ10 and PQQ in one supplement. And L-carnosine. So these would be your hacks to have a mighty mitochondria, which means all of these are anti-aging. Yes, this L-carnosine is one of my favorite best-kept anti-aging supplements that is amazing for your mitochondria. Now, when we go to our fourth step, to improve your blood-brain barrier um, integrity, blood-brain barrier integrity. So these are some additional awesome supplements. The ones that I had suggested already, um, a lot of them will improve the blood-brain barrier integrity, obviously because they're decreasing inflammation. But these are some additional ones that you want to um, maybe add to your repertoire. So uh, sulfaphane, this is actually the um, component of leafy green vegetables such as broccoli. And there's some really good research around sulfaphane and specifically blood-brain barrier. Um, I think that they did the research in Alzheimer's. Uh, some of the other ones, D3, vitamin A. So vitamin A is your um, endothelial optimization. So let's say you did have COVID and you had some respiratory issues, make sure you're taking your vitamin A, make sure you're taking your vitamin C. Endothelial here, these two guys, yes. Hydroxytyrosol, this is found in olive leaf extract. It's a great anti-inflammatory. Um, carbon 60 or C60 is often referred to. It's a nanoparticle, which means it can cross the blood brain barrier and it has antiviral properties. So I've been taking carbon 60 for the past 10 days um, and I'm taking it because of having COVID. And since we don't know a lot about this virus, do we know if it sits in a house and it hangs out in the central nervous system, just like Epstein-Barr and HIV? I personally do not want to find out. So I am doing literally everything in, in the books and in kind of research and 
you know, at my uh, disposal to try to clear my body of every viral particle and inflammatory cytokine that is uh, remnants of having COVID. Astragalus, so this is a great mushroom that is anti-inflammatory, and then um, chaga mushroom. Chaga mushroom is has very high levels of vitamin C, um, and there's some uh, research or kind of publications around uh, in China patients that were on Chinese medicine chaga mushroom actually did not present um, COVID symptoms. So uh, we started doing that one uh, at my family. So then let's go into our last way. And then I have a bonus slide for you is to increase cholinergics. So let's say that, let's say you had COVID or let's say you had some brain fog or you have IBS or an autoimmune condition and you're having some just kind of less optimal cognitive brain function let's say. So you're going to start to optimize your gut. You're going to decrease your systemic and your brain inflammation. You're going to increase your blood brain barrier integrity, and you're going to boost up your mitochondria. So you're doing that. But now in the meantime, you still want to make sure that your brain and your cognition are functioning properly. So this is where I go to nootropics. And the type of nootropics that I focus on and that I often recommend are what are called cholinergic nootropics. So they upregulate acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter that essentially turns on your brain. There's different neurotransmitters. We reference serotonin. Serotonin is important for blood brain barrier integrity. But here, this one, cholinergic ones, they're the ignition to your brain. So if you're feeling a little fuzzy upstairs, maybe you had COVID and you're trying to get your brain back, I would consider exploring researching different cholinergic nootropics. So now when you look at different cholines, this is the most cholinergic one because it's literally choline based, is there's different forms of choline. Choline bipartite is very cheap. You do not want to use it. It has very poor bioavailability. Alpha GPC is the middle one. This has a higher bioavailability. It's probably the most common and uh, most accessible cholinergic nootropic that you will see. But the one that you want to take is called CDP choline. CDP choline is the one that they actually use. It's prescribed in a lot of um, neurodegenerative diseases. It is the one that is the most medically FDA indicated for um, certain conditions. So that is the one that I would recommend, CDP choline. Then when you're taking CDP choline, if you take uridine at the same time as CDP choline, you actually get an uptick in the cholinergic effect of the CDP choline. And then finally, anytime you take uridine and CDP choline, you want to increase the efficacy of these nootropics by taking an omega. So this would be a stack. So if you've ever, if, you've, if you're into biohacking or you're, uh, kind of dappled a little bit with nootropics, you know that they're called stacks. So this is the stack that you would take is a CDP choline. I'll tell you what, what I take. I take 500 milligrams of CDP choline. I take 250 milligrams of uridine, and then I take a thousand milligrams of omega-3. That's my stack. And because I've been through COVID and I'm trying to get my brain back to where it, where it was pre all of this, I'm doing that stack two times a day. And now again, I'm not uh, prescribing any of these things, I encourage you to research them and you make your own educated decision based off of um, your body and your comfort level off of this research. But just know that when it comes to different nootropics and really different supplements in general, is that more is not always better. So if I said, oh, I want to get more cholinergic effects, so I'm going to take not 500 milligrams, I'm going to take 1,000 milligrams, you actually don't get a higher efficacy with a lot of supplements that way. The way that you increase efficacy of different supplements is to stack them. So that means you have to be educated or do the education to understand how to stack. How do you get a better effect? Another stack that you will often hear about is you want to take vitamin D3 with vitamin A. That is a stack. So you want to take them together. 
uh, another stack just real quick <laughs> is magnesium. When you take magnesium, you want to take omegas with magnesium. That's a stack. You get a higher efficacy of the magnesium when you stack it that way. Okay, so here's your bonus slide. Here's your bonuses. And then we are wrapping up. If you have any questions, we will go through those. So here's your bulletproof bonuses. We have IV NAD. So if you are saying that I don't care what cost it is, I want to get my brain back or I want to protect my brain or I want to protect my body, I want to stay young forever, whatever the reason is, IV NAD. So instead of you taking it by mouth that I had mentioned it for mitochondrial function, you actually want to take it IV because you do not get as high of, a, of absorption with anything when you do it by mouth. IV will always have a higher absorption of any supplement. Uh, IV NAD, just so you know, they are expensive. So they are about $700 for a one dose of the IV NAD. It takes quite a while for you to, um, for it to essentially titrate into the body. Um, average about three to four hours. So you'd have to sit there on the chair with an IV in your arm for around three, four hours. Um, but uh, the results of it are supposed to be incredible. I have not done it yet because of COVID and everyone's shelter in place. So I'm trying to uh, save that for immediately after everyone goes back to work. What I have done though, which is um, honestly my saving grace, it's a very controversial uh, topic. So if you are against it, please don't hate me. <laughs> IV ozone. So doing IV ozone, so you're doing essentially a syringe of ozone that is pushed directly into your vein. A lot of people freak out that you're going to get an air embolism. But what ozone does is it's an O3 molecule. And when it enters the body, O2 breaks off, right? That's oxygen. And then the O negative becomes a free radical, a free radical that attacks of hydrogen peroxide and ozone. Now, another way that you can get your body uh, bulletproof is by detoxing. So you want to sweat out a lot of the toxins from either a viral infection, an inflammatory response, um, different metals that are in the body. And that's partly the infrared sauna. That's partly, you know, the hydrogen peroxide bath, Epsom salt soaks, doing lymphatic massages, doing dry brushing, and then stimulating the vagus nerve because you want to make sure that your autonomic nervous system, which is linked to the immune system, is also on point. If you have any questions on anything that we went over, I want to give you that opportunity to ask those questions. Otherwise, this recording will be sitting on ebfaglobal.teachable.com. You will be able to access it. It will also be sitting on youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness, which is where all of our webinars are recorded and housed. If you have any questions, I'll be to type those in.